I'm standing here in the road where on 26th of April 1999, UK TV presenter Jill Dando was shot dead at 11.30 in the morning. Pre the 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers, less people would have entertained a possible political motive for the murder. Programmes such as Channel 4's Cutting Edge, Raphael Rourke's documentary for the BBC, and articles in The Independent on Sunday and Sunday Times have all cast doubt on Barry George's subsequent conviction. However, they all beg the question, if Barry George didn't commit her murder, then who did? On the basis of research, much of which was provided by true crime writer Scott Lomax, in this video we are asking people to consider the following possibilities about the real killers of Jill Dando and the circumstances surrounding her death. The story begins two weeks before the murder, when Jill became convinced she was being stalked. She was right. The stalker became known as Trilby Man, who was spotted at various locations around Jill's home prior to the murder. He was also seen standing at the same place at widely different times, for no obvious reason. Like all good hat wearers in the old movies, Trilby Mann was an agent in this country with foreign connections, and his cover was to own a small garage business on the outskirts of London. How did Jill acquire such a stalker? The answer lies in an April TV appeal that Jill made on behalf of Kosovan refugees. It was an appeal that prompted Trilby Mann to send Jill a letter criticising her actions. But why should anybody take offence at such a humanitarian gesture? At the time of Jill's death, we were at war with Serbia, a war that was little understood. It was covered extensively in the news, but as usual, this coverage focused very much on the effects rather than the cause. To kill Jill Dando would not have had much support amongst Serbs in general. However, amongst other things, they were upset that while the Kosovan Albanian refugees were shown on TV fleeing south in desperate circumstances, no mention was made of Serbian refugees fleeing north as the Kosovan Albanians returned. The Serbs generally felt that they got bad press at the time, and they probably had a point. It was unlikely they would want to make relations with the British media even worse by killing one of TV's most popular presenters. However, to some more extreme elements, Jill Dando's TV appeal was like a red rag to a bull. Two days before the murder, two men flew in from Europe. Although travelling on the same plane, they travelled separately and checked individually into the same hotel. One of them collected a package from reception containing two of the three pay-as-you-go mobile phones that had previously been purchased by Trilby Mann. The two men later met outside the hotel and made their way to Trilby Mann's garage by taxi. The man who was to become Jill Dando's killer expertly set about using the machine tools to reactivate the 9mm deactivated, now blank-firing handgun purchased by the garage owner a year earlier. He also crimped the cartridge tight around the bullet in order to muffle the sound of any shot. Meanwhile, the man who was to become the getaway driver on the day of the murder assisted in changing the number plates on the dark blue Range Rover recently acquired by Trilby Man at auction. On the eve of the murder, the killer came to survey the scene for himself. He was spotted here wearing his distinctive three-quarter length coat, staring down Gowan Avenue at around 8 o'clock in the evening. So what happened on that fateful day? At 6.50am, the dark blue Range Rover containing the three men pulled up at the side of Munster Road. Trilby Mann, who was wearing a dark suit, but no Trilby, got out of the car and kept watch. The Range Rover moved on, turned down Gowan Avenue, and double parked opposite Jill Dando's home. The man in the knee-length coat got out of the car and knocked on her door. There was no answer. The men clearly did not know her very well. Due to her steady relationship with her boyfriend, Jill's visits to her own home were fairly random. The morning was a frustrating one for the three men. They were spotted behaving suspiciously near Jill's home at various intervals. One key witness was a traffic warden who started entering the details of the then illegally parked Range Rover on her handheld. 
However, the driver started tapping on the windscreen threateningly, waving her away. Successfully intimidated, she deleted the details and left. The driver was becoming anxious and phoned the others to say that he was going to drive and wait alongside Bishop's Park to avoid further attention. By 11am, the very agitated would-be killers were almost ready to give up. But at that very moment, Jill Dando made the fateful decision to return home. On the way, she stopped outside Cope's Seafood Company about 500 yards from her street to buy some fish at about 11.20am. Trilby Man, minus the Trilby, called ahead on his mobile to say that Jill, in her distinctive BMW, was on her way. At 11.30, Jill Dando pulled up outside her home and walked up her short drive. She did not give a second thought to the man walking towards her, who then suddenly turned up the drive also. She let out a short scream as she saw the man with the gun, and a louder, longer scream as he wrestled her to the ground. He pressed the gun tight against her left ear to further muffle the sound of the gunshot and reduce blood spatter, and pulled the trigger. For certain, this man had killed many times before. Was he also the killer of a newspaper owner, critical of the Milosevic regime, that had been murdered in Belgrade in similar circumstances two weeks earlier, perhaps? Leaving Jill dying on the doorstep, the man calmly walked back down the drive and made a call on his mobile to the driver. Meanwhile, Trilby Man was fast becoming sweating man, running down Gowan Avenue on the opposite side of the road in order to catch up with the action. The killer pushed the gate shut with his hand in his pocket so as not to leave any fingerprints and turned left. After calmly walking for a short while, he broke into a run, but realising he was being watched, calmly walked again. The two assassins took slightly different routes to the rendezvous point at Bishop's Park. The killer detoured left down Kimball Gardens and then right down Edgar Lee Terrace instead of heading straight down Gowan Avenue. The killer was seen leaning over railings talking on his mobile once more. Also at 11.40, just 10 minutes after the murder, the sweating man, alias Trilby Man, threw his knife into the bushes nearby. As there was no obvious connection between sweating man and Jill's executioner, it was decided that the killer would rendezvous with the driver while the other would leave the scene by bus. The sweating man therefore ran back across Fulham Palace Road to wait at the bus stop. He waited here in a clearly agitated state before getting on to the next bus, a number 74. He asked for Putney Bridge. Once at a safe distance though, he left the bus early. If he had got off at his stated destination, he would have been caught on CCTV cameras. meanwhile had made his way to the Range Rover located at the edge of the park. It was seen emerging at great speed from Donner A Street here at 11.45, carrying two men, one who was said to be very Mediterranean looking. The car travelled very fast through a red light and off into the distance.